the problem with uh, introductions like that is you don't recognize yourself and you expect someone else to walk up. <laughs> it seems um, bizarrely distant from who I feel I am. Um, but anyway, um, I want to go through uh, some of the work that went into the spirit level. Um, and uh, showing you the relationships between the extent of income inequality in different societies and uh, a range of uh, different problems, and then tell you something about the social or psychological processes that lie behind those relationships and, and perhaps explain them. I may say I felt uh, surprised to be invited th to this, but now I understand a little bit more how law and inequality relate to each other. Um, I, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted, actually, that it is, uh, these things are coming together. Um, I like to start off with, uh, is it? Yes, this slide. Um, I don't know why it says one of nine in the middle. <laughs> but uh, I, I like to start off with this because it shows how miserable we all are. Um, these are people going to work um, just outside Oxford Street tube station. They're people in the prime of life in one of the richest societies. And it, it reminds me that uh, part of what I have to say touches on why our societies are, in a sense, such an inefficient way of producing well-being. You know, rates of mental illness and uh, uh, psychosocial problems seem to be rising uh, in rich countries. Um, but basically, what I have to say through most of my talk is just this. Um, that the bigger the income differences, the more of a whole se series of uh, health and social problems. I found that on Google Images and I felt somebody's understood. Um, <laughs> as I'm sure people have to give le lectures of discovered Google Images is a wonderful source of slides. Um, uh, what we did, though, and uh, I'll be showing you this in, with uh, different problems up the side, is basically take measures of income distribution in, in the rich developed countries. Um, uh, what this is, is simply showing you that how big the gap is in each country between the richest and poorest 20%. But on the left, you see the more equal countries, Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and the top 20% are getting three and a half or four times as much as the bottom 20%. But on the right there, Singapore, USA, Portugal, UK, uh, the gap is twice as big, um, seven, eight, nine times as much for the top 20% as the bottom 20%. That's data, and we never compiled our own data, we just downloaded it. This comes from the UN Human Development Report. It's the same data as the World Bank had at the time, um, and our other um, uh, outcome measures come from things like OECD and WHO and so on. Uh, and if we were to compile data on different um, health and social problems uh, that I'm going to show you related to inequality, inevitably there would be a bias I introduced because we'd say, oh, that doesn't look right, um, uh, something wrong with that data, and we'd ex start excluding <laughs> things that didn't fit. So actually we have an absolute rule. If our data source, like the UN, has data for one of the countries we're dealing with, it goes into the analysis. We make no judgments of the quality of data from those organizations, except the reputation of those organizations um, uh, gives some grounds for thinking it's, it's good data. The first thing we did was uh, put together for each country data on life expectancy, young people's maths and literacy scores, infant mortality rates, homicide rates, imprisonment, uh, that's simply the proportion of the population in prison, teenage birth rates, measures of how much people tr feel they can trust others um, from, I think, the World Values Survey, obesity rates, mental illness, which in the standard uh, psychiatric classification of mental illnesses includes drug and alcohol addiction as a mental illness, um, and some figures on, on social mobility. And here they are all weighted equally in one index of health and social problems. 
and along the bottom you've got uh, that rainbow striped measure of inequality I showed you in the last slide. So on the right you have the more unequal countries doing worse on all those measures and on the left um, uh, more equal ones doing better. Smaller income gaps, less of all these problems. Um, we were a bit bothered when we were writing our book um, when, at a time when nobody talked about inequality at all, um, that people would uh, think we'd just chosen problems to suit our argument. I mean, we were expecting opposition. So uh, we also looked at the um, UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing. Um, it's made up, as I say, by UNICEF. It's designed to measure child well-being in the rich countries and uh, it has about 40 different components. So, you know, whether there's bullying in schools, whether kids feel they can talk to their parents, what immunization rates are like, all that kind of stuff goes into it. Um, also, the proportion of kids in relative poverty in each country, and as that's so like a measure of inequality, um, that suggests it would be a bit of a circular argument to show that relative poverty is related to inequality, so we took that out of it. Um, and uh, in our book, actually, we showed the earlier UNICEF index showing standards of child well-being much lower in more unequal countries on the right. Um, uh, this is a more recent um, index that UNICEF have uh, produced. We also looked at changes over a 10-year period and sure enough, the countries that have had the biggest increases in inequality have had deteriorations in uh, standards of, of child well-being. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I want to go through some of the components of that index. This, uh, for example, is a, a measure of mental illness um, coming from WHO. It's not dependent on, the, on actually going in and being diagnosed with depression or, or, or being admitted to mental hospital or something like that uh, because that would be too influenced by how you access medical care in each country. Uh, this is based on uh, WHO using diagnostic interviews on random samples of the population. So instead of asking, have you been diagnosed with depression or anxiety or whatever, you ask questions about uh, how you sleep and feelings of self-worth and so on that have been found to be, um, and in very careful studies, found to be indicative of uh, mental illness. Uh, and basically, uh, you see at the bottom left here about... Uh, um, 8% of the population had uh, any mental illness in the, the previous year, rising to three times that level in the USA or UK, uh, in really huge differences uh, in the proportion of mental illness. We've, we've now actually filled, um, discovered some of the particular mental illnesses that lie behind this general relationship, which we'll come to later. Um, this is imprisonment, prisoners per 100,000 population. Uh, note it's a log scale here, so the difference from 1 to 10 is the same as 10 to 100 or 100 to 1,000. Uh, and if it wasn't on a log scale, there would be a huge curve going up like that. But, and it's harder to judge where intervening points are, but uh, uh, Japan is about 40. Um, prisoners per 100,000, and it goes up over 400. So you've got tenfold differences in the proportion of the population locked up. Uh, it's not mainly more crime. Uh, some of it's more crime, but most of it is more punitive sentencing in more unequal societies. We've also looked at the index of, uh, not the index, uh, what's it called, um, the age at which children are held criminally responsible. Uh, and it too is younger in more unequal societies. So, you know, I don't know whether this is a reflection of more fear up and down the social hierarchy or less empathy or, or what, um, uh, um, but I think it's, it's that area we need to be thinking about. Um, I'm not going to go on showing you these uh, slides forever, um, but this is a particularly important one. Um, because many people think that huge inequalities of outcome, huge 
differences in income, you know, some people getting several million a year while others are living on uh, less than the living wage, is fair if, if everyone can find their right level in society. The idea if you work harder, you move up, and if you don't, you move down, and so on. What this shows is um, that where income differences are bigger, there is less social mobility. Um, uh, I think we were the first people actually to show this relationship on a smaller number of countries, but um, to sort of escape uh, the blame or responsibility, I like to show other people's graphs. Uh, so this comes from the Brookings Institute in Washington. Um, uh, the measure of social mobility is intergenerational income mobility. So it's really asking, do rich fathers have rich sons and poor fathers have poor sons? It's not mothers' and daughters' incomes because there are such big changes in women's economic activity rates from one generation to another that it's harder to do. Um, but basically what this is saying is the more unequal the society um, the further away, well, the more, more important your father's income is as a determinant of what happens to you, the further away you are for, from equal opportunities for children. Uh, I, I do think now that, I mean, as this has been shown on several different uh, lots of data, that um, you know, probably the most important thing we can do f to move uh, uh, at least a little bit closer to equal opportunities is to reduce the differences in, in, in outcomes. Uh, that would uh, uh, reduce the inequalities in opportunities for children. Um, health is part of this picture. Primarily, primarily health of uh, young people and people of working age. Uh, this one is... Uh, uh, um, comes from the British Med Medical Journal, but the um, uh, more equal societies on this are on the right-hand end. So lower death rates in the American states and Canadian provinces that have smaller income differences. Uh, it's quite a striking uh, relationship. Um, there are much less... Uh, uh, there's less evidence or almost no evidence of relationships between inequality and death rates of people my age and, and older. Um, these are the correlations between age-specific death rates. So this is uh, uh, infants, this is uh, up to 14-year-olds, so this is 15 to 49, 50 to 64, 65 to 90-year-olds. And it's the correlation with inequality um, and so you see it's stronger and gets weaker and weaker um, until it's just about disappeared at older ages. But that is a relationship with current inequality. Uh, and it looks now as if uh, um, along lag periods, several studies have suggested that, you know, we really need to be correlating income inequality um, f uh, my experience in the past, if you're going to relate it to, to my health. Um, so it, it may be that these uh, relationships are even more powerful than, than um, uh, people have yet been able to show. Um, you know, we may be able to show it if we had uh, lifetime uh, measures of income inequality that were comparable between countries, which is a, a bit of a tall order. Um, I now want to give you a glimpse of what I think is perhaps the most fundamental process lying behind uh, these statistical relationships. Um, it really concerns the quality of social relationships in society. Um, this is a measure of civic participation. It's a bit like Putnam's measures in bowling alone of people's involvement of, in community life, uh, whether they belong to civic associations, voluntary groups, and so on. Um, and you see uh, much weaker and more unequal countries on the right. Um, <coughs> quite big differences in the proportion of the, the civic participation score. You also find measures of trust um, lower in more unequal societies. People, and this uh, is on the vertical axis measuring uh, the proportion of the population who agree that most people can be trusted. 
I should say we've done all this work not only for the rich developed countries, but also for the 50 American states, asking just the same question, do the more unequal states uh, do worse? Uh, and the federal government has almost exactly the same measure of trust and the relationship with inequality in the American states is almost exactly the same. Um, but, you know, here you've got at the far end, I don't know, 15 or 20 percent of the population feel they can trust others. But in the more equal societies, it rises to 60 or 65 percent. And, you know, if you've got to walk home alone late at night in a big city, you'll just feel much safer doing it in one of the more equal societies. And, you know, in terms of human rights and the rights of women, um, you know, this is a monstrously important issue um, to feel safe. And, you know, if you're in, in a big city in the United States walking, well, perhaps you don't walk home late at night. On, um, uh, and if you do, you're very aware of who's around you on the street. Um, but in somewhere like Scandinavian countries, you unwind. You don't have to be aware of that kind of thing. It's, it's not an issue. There are also papers which show that people are less willing to help each other in more unequal societies. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, people are less willing to help um, uh, people with disabilities or the elderly. So it looks as if you move from societies where people have a lot to do with each other, strong community life, a good deal of reciprocity, sense of trust and community to uh, these societies where that all begins to break down, community life atrophies, and violence rises. Red dots are American states. Um, the blue triangles are Canadian provinces. This is homicides per million. Uh, and again, enormous differences. That would be 15 homicides per million. And it rises to 150, um, tenfold differences. And it's a pretty striking relationship. I may say that these relationships, people began to uh, show them um, relationships between inequality and death rates and inequality and homicide uh, as a measure of violence in the 1970s. And there are now simply hundreds of papers on these relationships. And there must be 60 on hom uh, homicide rates and inequality around the world. Um, so, you replace the good community relationships, the trust, with uh, uh, something much nastier and uh, um, the breakdown of, of social life. If you go to much more unequal societies than in the United States or Britain or in the ones in our data set, if you go to countries like Mexico, um, you see that this has gone a stage further. Um, Houses have uh, these huge fences around them, razor wire around the top, bars on the windows and doors and so on. Um, people are afraid, afraid of each other in those societies. Um, and in uh, South Africa, just the same thing. Um, house after house with these uh, the, the horizontal lines at the top are an electric fence. And this says armed response. So if you're seen climbing in, you might get shot. Uh, and if you don't get shot, uh, you perhaps can see the two huge dogs there that'll eat you. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's an appalling picture. Um, and yet it's pretty well established. And uh, I have no doubt that I'm giving you the right interpretation of it because there is some completely different data that basically makes exactly the same point. Um, this comes from two American economists, uh, Bowles and Jayadev, and uh, this is actually something they published in the New York Times, but they've uh, published this in, in journals, uh, uh, both internationally for different countries and for the American states in separate analyses. What it's showing is the proportion of the population in each country involved in what they call guard labor, security staff, police, um, prison officers, uh, people like that. Basically, the people we use to defend ourselves against, uh, uh, from each other. Um, and you see 
uh, higher in, in more unequal countries. Um, and it goes with that higher imprisonment, that breakdown of trust um, uh, and community life and so on. Um, I think that what I've been telling you about in the last few slides really uh, underlies some of the relationships I've been showing you. I don't think inequality of income or, or, or wealth, if we had more internationally comparable data on wealth inequality, uh, is something new, a new influence on um, uh, outcomes that we didn't know about. I think it's telling us more about the sort of uh, social hierarchy, the class differences in societies. And basically, I think it's telling us whether we've got a very steep social pyramid like that or, or a much shallower one like, like that. Um, and uh, uh, depending on the shape, and it, basically, the bigger the material differences between us, the bigger the social distances and those feelings of superiority and inferiority, if you like. Uh, the idea that some people are bit better and more important than others and other people, you know, are worthless or whatever. Uh, all those kinds of things are made worse by, by uh, inequality. Um, the only surprise is, I, I've been showing you how big the differences are in the performance of more and less equal countries on some of those uh, graphs. Um, they're so big because it's not just the poor who are being affected by inequality. Um, this graph uh, shows young people's literacy scores uh, between 16 and 25. They're classified here by how many years of education their parents have had. So those are the kids of parents who've had 12, 13, 14, 15 years of education. Whereas down here, you've got uh, kids whose parents have had five, six, seven, eight years of education. Um, and so, you know, those are higher status kids and these are lower status kids. And what it shows you is there is a much steeper social gradient in more unequal USA than, than more equal Sweden. But note, this is not telling you whether Sweden or the USA has more poor people or more people in poorly educated, um, so on. It's saying wherever you are in the hierarchy, you do worse in a more, equal, more unequal society. So compare people who've had, uh, parents have had 12 years education. They do better in Sweden than in the USA. It isn't a matter of absolute standards of living. It's a matter of the differences between us. Uh, we know of about a dozen papers looking at different outcomes using multi-level models where you control for individual income and then see if there's a sort of extra contextual effect of in, uh, the kind of the inequality in the society you live in. And uh, uh, our strong impression is that the nearest you can get to a, a, an accurate generalization about the effects of inequality is that the effects are biggest at the bottom of society, but even near the top, there is a small advantage in being in a more equal society. Now, uh, another um, approach to what's lying behind these uh, uh, relationships. If you live in a society where some people are hugely important and others are worthless, uh, then I think we all become more worried about how we are seen and judged. How, and we judge each other more by, uh, by money and status and so on. Um, and uh, we had just guessed that this was about those kinds of things in our spirit level book judging partly by psychological experiments, usually, you know, those things where students are invited into a lab and given some what often seem like um, remarkably trivial experiments that seem to uh, show remarkable things and you're never quite sure whether you can trust it in those kind of contexts. But this uh, has come out uh, more recently since we were writing and uh, uh, what it shows is uh, for different income groups in each country, this is the poorest tenth of the population going up to the uh, 
um, the richest tenth of the population, that uh, there are higher levels of status anxiety all the way across the income scale in more unequal societies, the top line, uh, and less status anxiety in uh, more equal societies. And we need to start thinking about all those feelings within us of, you know, our worries about how we're seen and judged. They aren't just part of the human condition, they're made worse, they're intensified by uh, inequality. Uh, let me tell you though, this again comes from those experiments in psychological laboratories and universities around the world. It's a meta-analysis of them. Uh, the experiments involved exposing uh, volunteers to some stressful activity. You know, so you might be asked to write about an un unpleasant experience you've had or asked to do various mathematical problems, um, uh, things of that kind. And um, uh, what they were interested in is how your uh, stress hormones responded to different stressful activities. And um, uh, uh, they measured cortisol, you can measure it in the saliva uh, or in blood. And um, in the meta-analysis, they were trying to find out what kind of stressful ex uh, experiences used in these experiments most reliably and most dramatically pushed up our cortisol levels. And they say it's tasks which included social evaluative threat, threats to self-esteem or social status, uh, where um, others, uh, uh, where you, you face the possibility of negative judgments. So, for instance, public speaking is stressful because we're afraid of making a fool of ourselves in front of others. Um, and uh, so, you know, the two blocks there, these are um, uh, experiments that didn't have tasks of that kind. Um, they didn't expose you to others' judgments. They were other kinds of stresses, and they didn't push up cortisol levels as much. Now you can see immediately these to do with the social evaluative threat, self-esteem, social status, and so on, relates uh, directly to what I've been talking about. Um, we now know that actually I showed you a graph earlier on suggesting that uh, mental illness was more common in more unequal societies. Uh, since then, a paper has come out, uh, published uh, the first author is Sherry Johnson at Berkeley, um, a psychologist, and she uh, went through an enormous uh, volume of um, uh, research papers on, on mental health. Uh, and. Uh, looking for different kinds of evidence, um, uh, not just one kind, but behavioral evidence, self-report evidence, experimental evidence, uh, that mental illnesses of different kinds are related to issues to do with dominance and subordination. And uh, we now know that there are areas of the brain um, which they call the dominance behavioral system that deal with issues to do with dominance and subordination. And obviously, you, you know, you'd never doubt that uh, animals with awful ranking systems um, needed areas like that, but we have, have two. And uh, they say that uh, anxiety and depression are related to subordination, to submissiveness, to the desire to avoid, avoid the desire to avoid subordination, feeling you're being put down, but struggling against it, you know, defending yourself um, against disrespect and so on. Uh, mania and narcissistic traits related to self, uh, inflated self-perceptions of power. Uh, externalizing disorders, uh, disorders, mania, proneness, pro, uh, so on, related to um, <coughs> uh, th these are the things related to heightened dominance motivation. What Sherry Johnson didn't know when she wrote that paper was that societies are not all the same. I think she thought, okay, they've all got these social class hierarchies. Uh, which trigger these sorts of problems. But a real test, both of our theory of the importance of inequality and her theory that these conditions were related to um, 
uh, dominance and subordination was when uh, I, I pointed out to her that there was beginning to be evidence, and we did another paper together, showing that various mental illnesses were indeed more common, as predicted, in societies with uh, uh, bigger inequalities. Uh, so we know that depression is more common. Um, uh, the picture we think uh, coming out of this is that, you know, if you feel really worried about how you're seen and judged, uh, social life becomes more stressful. You know, meeting, going to social meetings, events and so on, um, you try, start trying to avoid it. Um, and uh, you withdraw from social life uh, and associated with depression. Problems of low self-esteem, um, things like that. But there is also the opposite response. You know, if you're worried about how you're judged, you can either go under with low self-esteem, low self-worth and so on, or you can do the opposite. You can start doing a sort of self-aggrandizement, self-advertisement, bigging yourself up in other people's eyes. And that seems to happen too. So um, in, this is from an international team of psychologists. They asked people in these different countries, how do you think you can pair with the average in your country? Um, do you think you're cleverer than the average English person? Do you think you're gener more generous? Do you think you're more attractive? Do you think you're better drivers than the average? Um, and uh, in more unequal countries, uh, people rate themselves more highly. Um, a really strong relationship, uh, bigging themselves up. Um, and interestingly, that uh, having to appear tough in more unequal countries, you find Papers that use self-reports of health ask people, in the last month, has your health been uh, excellent, good, fair, poor, uh, or poor? Um, the results of questionnaires of that kind don't correlate at all with um, uh, inequality, and nor do they correlate with uh, objective measures of health, like life expectancy and death rates. Uh, the, the need to big yourself up, to be tough, um, uh, it seems to even go into things like uh, self-reports of health. So they lose the relationship with objective indicators of health. Um, and of course what we do very commonly to um, present ourselves well in other people's eyes is um, uh, consumerism, status consumption, and again there are papers now showing that if you live in a more air, uh, unequal area you're more likely to spend money on a flashy car uh, and to look uh, to do Google searches for um, uh, status goods. You can now use Google's data for that kind of thing. Uh, and that, I think, also uh, is one of the things that lies behind this relationship. As inequality increased, so debt increased. You know, you borrow to maintain your, keep up your expenditure, um, uh, trying to show your self-worth. Um, yeah, there's this sort of extraordinary opposition you see in, in uh, the social epidemiology. You know, I came at this through looking at uh, health inequalities. Um, social status, low social status, really damaging to health. In London civil servants, the junior office staff have death rates three, at least three times as high as the senior after you've adjusted for all sorts of things. Um, societies, as I said, with bigger status differences, worse health. But friendship is exactly the opposite to that. Friendship is, is a really powerful protector of health. Uh, whether or not you have friends, uh, in a meta-analysis, 150 studies studying friendship and health, shows that whether or not you have friends is at least as important, perhaps marginally more important, than whether or not you smoke to your survival over a follow-up period. Not just observational studies, but experiments where they make little wounds on you and watch how quickly they heal. Or give you nasal drops with cold viruses in and see how many develop colds from the, the same measured exposure to infection. To be well integrated socially is highly beneficial to health. 
it's the opposite of the divisiveness of social status differences. You know, we can come together in one of two ways. Either I'm better than you and we, we can fight over access to uh, everything we want, uh, or we can uh, uh, recognize each other's needs, uh, uh, the, the reciprocity and, and so on. Uh, and you can see it even in our language, in words like companion is con and pan, your, your companions are the people with whom you share the necessities of life. Um, and this wonderful American anthropologist, Marshall Salins, um, who one of the anthropologists who made us aware that um, hunting and gathering societies, i.e. 90% of our existence as modern, anatomically modern human beings, we lived in really egalitarian societies. Um, he says, gifts make friends and friends make gifts. Uh, because the gift is a symbol that I recognize your need. Instead of fighting you for access to everything, you know, there's always in, within a species this terrible possibility for, for conflict because members of the same species have the same needs. You know, I even see the birds on our bird table in our garden. It's members of the same species that fight. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, um, yet, the, as I say, the gift shows that I recognize your need and your feeling of, uh, of indebtedness that perhaps makes you uh, reciprocate, he points out, is a, um, uh, uh, perhaps a basic human universal that creates a social compact. So in a way, I think that I mean, if you go into the evolutionary psychology, it's clear that we have two social strategies uh, we can play the dominance game, um, but we also know how to deal with, uh, how to make friends, maintain friendships, and so on. Um, uh, uh, and I think that basically what's happening, and we, we all use both strategies, but how much we use one and how much we use the other is influenced powerfully by the extent of inequality in society. This is what's happened to income differences. You've got 1961 here, uh, the big rise starting about 1980 here. Um, and depending on what measure of inequality, it's, it's slightly, well, there hasn't been a very dramatic change uh, since uh, the late 80s, around 1990. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, I, I think there are two quite different ways of, of uh, approaching it. Um, either looking at income differences before tax. Um, the main reason why we've become more unequal is the, income, the growth of differences in incomes before tax. Um, uh, and uh, stronger trade unions are important. I'll show you this, uh, data. Uh, I think we need to increase uh, company democracy, more democratic models of companies seem to have smaller income differences. You know, you might think your boss should have twice as much as you, but you probably don't think he should have two or three hundred times as much as you. Um, uh, uh, we need to promote more directors from within companies. Uh, strategies of that kind, I think, are helpful, but obviously uh, redistributing um, after people have got their very different incomes. Um, we must deal with tax avoidance, tax havens, and uh, make taxation uh, progressive again. I may say th this is just a scattering of countries, but this pattern is very general of inequality declining from sometime in the 1930s through bottoming out in the late 1970s, and then the modern rise of inequality, much bigger in some countries than others, but uh, widely shared that tendency. Um, I do think that is uh, the first the rise and then the fall of the whole labor movement. When I mentioned trade unions, uh, I've seen these graphs for about half a dozen countries. The top line is that U-shaped uh, change in inequality. It's the um, uh, share of income going to the top 10% of the population in the USA, that top red line, uh, falling um, 
through uh, the middle decades of the century and then rising again. And the bottom blue line is the proportion of the labor force in trade unions. I don't think trade unions uh, make such a huge difference simply to the pay of their members. I think trade union membership is, the indi is an indicator of the sort of strength of that whole uh, labor movement, social democratic parties, also the fear of communism. Uh, and I think all that rose and then declined and neoliberalism took over. Um, so, I, uh, and I think now we're unlikely to be able to recreate quite that same uh, movement. That's why I think we need to constrain top incomes through forms of economic democracy. And Theresa May did say she would introduce legislation of that kind, um, requiring employee representatives on the board. I imagine if, even if she had done it, it would, have, it would have just been token representation. In some European countries, it's quite strong. In Germany, it is. But I also think we need um, uh, incentives to uh, grow uh, employee-owned companies and uh, uh, cooperatives and so on, which, which now uh, good studies coming out of business schools, including the Harvard Business School, suggests that th those more democratic models uh, do better even in productivity terms. And uh, people say that an employee buyout turns a company from being a piece of property into a community. Um, so I, I think that these uh, uh, moving towards greater economic democracy uh, probably has many benefits. Um, and we know a number of um, successful examples. Um, um, so I'm going to stop there, except just to point out um, we've written a paper uh, discussing the enormous literature on the effects of inequality, looking at it in terms of um, whether it provides evidence uh, of causation rather than just correlation. Um, uh, we've uh, done a paper talking about the psychosocial processes that lie behind the relationships and then a, a, an idea of how we can use this uh, research to, to move uh, towards better and hopefully more sustainable societies. Um, I, but I should point out, our work, and when I say ours, I mean Kate and mine, uh, didn't do anything very new. As I say, this work has been accumulating in the journals that nobody reads since the 1970s. All we did was make it, make it more accessible to the public um, in the simplest version possible. Uh, so, you know, we don't show um, multi-level um, models of uh, meta-analyses of multi-level models of um, cohorts uh, experiencing different levels of inequality over time. Uh, we don't control for all sorts of things because so many other people have. Thank you. <laughs>